First time I've seen the firewood back here. That's nice. That's beautiful. Okay, the uh, printer in the hotel was broken. So I have to go new school and do my notes from my computer. So give me just a moment here. I have to use the assigned password they gave me, which I can never remember. And we're on. Greetings, everyone. It is good to uh, it's good to be back here. It's been uh, it's been a while since I've had a chance to come and and hang out with you all. Um, always enjoy that when I'm uh, had the opportunity to be here in in, in Southern Cal. I was um, I had the chance to have dinner with uh, Angie and Sadie Tabin last night and um, had a had a great time at a Argentinian restaurant in in Pasadena. I, I enjoyed that. Um, and uh, to get to come over and hang out with you, I bring greetings from on behalf of the denomination. I bring greetings on behalf of my home congregation of Eugene, Oregon. Um, they, uh, I would, uh, let's see, where are they at right now? Oh, they've been done for a while. I was going to say they're, uh, I would be, uh, my wife pastors both the Eugene and the Salem, Oregon congregation. And so right about now, we would be on the I-5 freeway trying to get to Salem for the afternoon service. So, um, but uh, I like it. Um, I pastored there, as some of you know, I pastored there for um, many, many years. And, and when I stepped down to be the regional director, um, I wondered who would they replace me with? How could they possibly replace me? <laughs> and they hired my wife and um, we did a really good job of replacing me. I will be quite honest. They've uh, they've been doing some incredible things and, uh, and it, and it is really strange to step out of the pastoral role and step into my, like I've told so many people, my job is I'm the pastor's arm candy. Um, I, I stand in my little corner and I play my guitar for worship. And uh, when they ask me questions, I go, you need to talk to the pastor about that. And it's, uh, it's an interesting position to be in. But I do also have the uh, the privilege of traveling around and experiencing so many other congregations. I just got back last week. I was in Helena, Montana, and uh, had a chance to go over there and uh, speak to and engage um, a congregation in Helena. I went over, and we have a, a small group in Missoula um, as well with Tim Love, and I went and uh, met with them, and, and not for church, but just to just to um, eat pizza and, and hang out. Um, I did schedule that one. I, I put a couple of days on the front end of that. So um, if I'm in Montana, it just wouldn't have been right if I didn't try to impress some fish in a river somewhere with my fly fishing technique. So apparently the fish in Montana are not familiar with Oregon fly fishing techniques because they weren't impressed. But but I did, uh, I did have a chance to and to enjoy that, and then I'll bounce out. I'm in Phoenix in a little while. I've got. I was, I was telling, uh, telling a couple of folk that um, I've got to, uh, I've got to go over. Hawaii has been a part of my region since I became regional director. But every time there was an issue in Hawaii, Greg Williams would go. You know, Tim, you're really busy. I'll cover that for you. Um, so. Greg's been doing so much traveling. He's in the Philippines right now. So I told him, <laughs> I'm doing Hawaii this time. So that'll be a real hardship. My uh, my wife is going to, one of the few times she gets to go with me on that. So, But it's uh, it's my privilege to be here today and to uh, unpack the, uh, the the passage for the RCL this week. I, um, I appreciated the scripture read, um, and I appreciated uh, Oceans. It really fits exactly where... Um, where I'm, uh, I'm going to be going today. I want to do something a little different. Um, there's a, a tradition in many of the, the Christian churches and in the Christian liturgy to do prayers of confession, to do prayers of repentance. We tend to not do that within our particular liturgy, and y'all do know you have a liturgy, right? I mean, if you do something three weeks in a row, it's liturgy. That's just kind of how we, we look at it. But the idea of, of, of a prayer, there's, a, there's an old prayer in, in the Christian church that speaks to where I want to go today with the scripture passage that you heard read and how I want to unpack it today. And so I'm going to pray this simple prayer. This is out of one of the common books of prayer. And it, uh, normally we would do it together as a recitation, but I tell you what, if you agree with it at the end, you can say amen. Simple prayer. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, 
word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will, walk in your ways to the glory of your name. And if you're comfortable with that prayer, join me in saying, Amen. Amen. One of the subjects it seems to, I can't get away from, I don't care where I'm at. Um, we, you know, we, we always like to talk about the weather. I live in Oregon. If you don't like the weather, wait 15 minutes. It will change. But um, the weather's been a little weird of late in various places, and that's a topic of discussion. But one of the ones I find anywhere I go now are gas prices. And I got to be honest, I've looked at those gas pump stations, you know, here. You guys are just, when are you rising up? And when's the revolt happening? And you get your pitchforks and your torches out and you start chasing oil companies down. Because I paid three fifty nine a gallon in Missoula, Montana a couple of days ago. And Missoula is nowhere near an oil refinery. You've got oil refineries. We'd almost see them if we got a little higher up on the roof. And you're paying six something a gallon. Okay, we we California, we gotta talk. I'm sorry. Oregon is right around four dollars a gallon. But we look at and, and gas prices become become a topic of conversation because they affect every single one of us. Whether you drive or not, they affect the cost of the goods that you buy because somebody had to had to truck those in. And and so we're affected. We're affected by things like gas prices. And uh Somehow talking about them, uh, venting about them makes us makes us feel just a little bit better, but it doesn't change them. That's the uh, that's the problem. By the way, I'm trying to figure out. I have a rental car that's um, it's electric and gas. Um, it's got a place to plug in as well as put gas in. And when I got it, the battery was fully charged. And apparently on this thing, as I'm looking at it, as you drive, if you drive cautiously and and conservatively, it's supposed to be charging the battery. I killed the battery on the drive up from the airport up to my hotel. So apparently I don't drive cautiously and conservatively. Battery's just dead on that thing. And so I'm down to using gas on it. Um, but I'd like to talk in my sermon today. I would like us to look at gasoline and the analogy of the gas tank. Simple container, gas tank. Holds the gas you need for your car. You fill it up at the gas station. And then you watch that needle go down and you hope that it doesn't get too far down before payday. And, you know, and if you're my wife, you believe E stands for, eh, I got enough. Um, And you pray, cross your fingers, and you also keep an eye on the pumps. Well, where's the cheapest gas station? Oh, I saw a gas station in town and it was it was five cents cheaper, so I'm going to use four dollars worth of gas to drive in there to get it five cents cheaper. <laughs> we sometimes get the idea though that our relationship with God is like a gas tank. This is true to some extent, because let's be honest, we all have times in our life where we feel like we're spiritually running on empty, don't we? when we're spiritually low. That's just a condition of of human life. We also have times, though, when after an inspiring worship service or an inspiring message or, or an opportunity to just be with others, spiritually we feel encouraged. We feel as if our, our tank is full somehow. But here's the problem. That analogy can be quite dangerous, can't it? Because faith is not like a gas tank that constantly needs to be topped off. And church is not a gas station that merely exists to service your Christianity, to boister your spirituality. The original disciples made a similar mistake in their thinking. Even though they didn't have gas tanks back then, um, they understood that that principle of needing to be filled up, and they thought it was somehow possible to have their faith tank filled. We, we heard it in the passage, did we not? In, uh, 
Luke 17, 5, and the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. The disciples are really a lot like us. Or maybe I should say we're a lot like them. They felt that if they had more faith, they could be better followers of Jesus. If they only had more faith, they could be better disciples. We, unfortunately, we tend to think like this too, too often. We often look at our life and and we're simply not pleased at, at what we see sometimes. We get this sense that if I just had more faith, I could be doing better. I could be more involved. I could I could be a better disciple. And we say to God the same thing that the disciples said to Jesus. Increase my faith. Before we look, though, at Christ's response to that question, let's go back and kind of kind of take a look at the uh, at the passage itself. I step down here a little bit closer here. I got fourteen emails since I walked up here. I am popular. What I want to do though is I want to take a look at at what was going on before the disciples asked that petition. Um, and so I am going to go to, I'll just start. There's a whole long list of things that you go through and Luke really kind of lists these, these off a number of different sayings of Jesus, a number of different situations. They may have all happened sequentially. He may have been picking and choosing from things as he wrote. Either would have been perfectly appropriate in the writing style of the day. But they obviously were significant, but they obviously begin to lead up to a point, and they really lead up to the point that we unpack in today's passage. But if you go back to to verse 17, chapter 1, we jump into one of these. It says, Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourself. Let's unpack that for just a moment as we continue. Watch yourself. Do we do things that would cause someone to stumble? Do we do things that would cause someone to maybe, maybe somebody new to their faith, to question their faith? to question their relationship with Jesus because of how we portray and how we demonstrate our relationship with Jesus? It's a little sidebar, and I'm not going to go off onto it long, but I'd like you to maybe contemplate that this week, coming week. What are some aspects that maybe in my life I'm guilty of that maybe I fall into the trap? Because we all do, by the way. We all do. And let me give you just a few examples. Right now, um, young adults in particular are not walking away from the church. They're running away from the church in droves right now because of some things that Christians now begin to say and begin to profess. We need to sit and go, okay, I can have my political beliefs, you can have your political beliefs, and I'm not going to question those. That's not my purpose here today. You can believe whatever you want, whoever you want. I believe in Bigfoot, so I'm, I will argue with you on the right to believe in anything you want to believe in. But does that particular belief picture what Jesus stood for? Does that particular belief, and you may believe it does on either side of the spectrum, and by the way, i you know, I'm not going to pick on any one political spectrum because that's like shooting domestic dairy cattle with a high-powered rifle and a scope. There's really no sport in it. And it doesn't matter which side of the, the aisle you're on. There's issues and challenges. So I'm not going to go there. But as you're avowing and espousing a particular viewpoint, is it causing somebody to question Jesus? Is it causing somebody to question their faith? Your particular view on race, is that causing somebody to go, well, uh, yeah, wait, 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 a, wait a minute. This person 
claims to be a Christian, I see Jesus with a different approach toward the immigrant, towards the different race, towards the sinner. I see Jesus not drawing the distinctions that I'm seeing the church draw these days. Maybe I'm in the wrong place. And by the way, you got to understand a little thing. I, I just had to have a conversation with a young lady um, recently, in a, something I would have rather not have had um, uh, because of a particular denominational policy that I'm stuck with, I'm bound by, by my employment. I had to tell her no to something that I really did not want to have to tell her no to because it questioned some aspect of her identity. And her statement was not, well, that, that's just it. I'm never coming back to this church. Her statement was, I'm never coming back to any church. We cause things in our, our various beliefs and positions. Now, we can do other dumb things. We can act out a certain way. We can behave a certain way. We have to be careful in certain certain, certain situations. I, it's, it's not a secret, and, and if this causes anybody to stumble, please talk to me first before you leave. It's, not, it's well known that, that I smoke cigars from time to time. I made that statement one time many years ago in a public setting, and I had people, I, I heard it, it was rumoring and bouncing all over through the church. Yeah. Pastor Tim smokes cigars, he smokes cigars, that's a sin. Smoking, smoking's a sin. I don't know where they ever, we ever got that from in the Bible, but he was like, well, it's just, the, the body is a temple. I know, this body's a tent, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, just, I'm just camping out in it for a while. I'm, I don't, you know, we could unpack that scripture in a different day, in a different time, and realize that the body that it's talking about is the temple, is the church. But that's beside the point. We had a, a notion at the time smoking was a sin. Oh, this is terrible. And so finally somebody came and they said, you know, when you announced that you smoke cigars, you're, you're causing people to sin. And I said, yeah, you're absolutely right. I am definitely causing people to gossip. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, I did have to take a step back and go, okay, at this point, in this time, in this place, is my example causing somebody to question their relationship with Jesus? And if it is, even if it's right, even if I'm comfortable with my beliefs, I have to be careful. There's a reason that we tell our pastors that this is sacred ground up here. This is a political ground up here because that's not what we're here for. Now, some churches break that rule. Some denominations break that rule and they side with and they, they, they promote and they, no, we bring people to Jesus Christ. And anything that we do, and if I tell you that Jesus was a fill in a party, and you go, no, he wasn't, and I create a barrier for you, and I cause you to stumble, there's something in here I remember reading about a millstone around the neck. I think it's important that we are aware of that. This passage needs to speak to us. Maybe at a time when the evangelical church in particular is coming apart at the seams, Maybe this is a really good time for us to be aware of what we say and what we do and what kind of an effect it might have on somebody new to their faith or maybe even somebody who just is, they've been around for a while, but they're just discouraged by what they're seeing. So that part of it, yeah, they're probably going, oh, okay, I'm probably good there, probably good there. The next part, though, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Yeah. You notice this is the point when they go, well, we're going to need more faith. This is the point in the whole conversation when they go, okay, 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 Jesus, you're going to have to help us out on this one because I, you know, I might forgive them once or twice or I'm not totally certain that I have forgiven a kid that I rode on the school bus with when I was in high school. You know, it's just, we, it's hard for us sometimes. And the terrible thing for me is my arch enemy in high school was a young man down the street named Matt Morgan. I work with. Uh, Matt Morgan, and I tell Matt every time I say, you know, just every time I say your name, I go back to a fist fight on a school bus in 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 in, in ninth grade. But but no, it's hard for us to forgive, and I got to forgive seven times in a day. Ah, Lord, 
Give me more faith. And that's pretty much where we see the story of our passage today coming in. Because it's as if we're all saying, you know, we're not able to do all this. You didn't give us enough faith to cover all of this. Please, Jesus, give us more. Otherwise, we're going to fail. Fill up our faith tank. And Jesus replies, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. I wish that worked for blackberries. Um, you don't have the issue here, but if you live in Oregon, blackberries are the kudzu of the Northwest. They grow everywhere. I first got to Oregon and I said, hey, blackberries, this is cool. Where do I get starts to plant this? And the people laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. It's not a question of planting blackberries. It's how do you get rid of blackberries? Like, apparently, I don't have enough faith because the blackberries are still growing on my property and I've not cast them into the sea. But I'm pretty sure that Jesus answered back to them on give us more faith. I'm pretty sure this isn't what they were expecting. This isn't what they were looking for. We might have expected Jesus to, I don't know, pray for them. Oh, Lord, give them more faith. Oh, Lord. Or maybe Jesus would pray to, a, you know, oh, Lord, give me more faith to deal with these knuckleheads. But whatever it was, this is probably not what they were expecting. Now, if we look at the Greek verb tense, and I'm not going to go all Greek off on you. Um, you, you you've got Michael Morrison to do that on a, on a regular basis. I won't go there. But I will tell you that the verb tense in the original language in this, is it really implies that the disciples did have faith, but that their faith was as small as a grain of mustard seed. And so, you know, you could almost, you know, paraphrase this. Um, you already have faith, you silly disciples. You just aren't using it. They didn't need to increase their faith. They needed to increase increase their faithfulness. I'm going to repeat that again. They didn't need to increase their faith. They needed to increase their faithfulness. And there is a very big difference. Faith, and I think we understand this, and I think we comprehend this, but faith is a gift from God. He gives us the amount of faith that we need. It doesn't run out to ask God to increase our faith. It really is almost kind of an insult. I had somebody one time, we do a song, and I don't know whether you guys do uh, Draw Me Close to You, if you've ever done. I had somebody who was just all offended over that song, and theologically, and I had to agree with their point. We still do the song, by the way, because it's a nice song, and everybody likes to sing it, and I don't. We, we, we do I'll Fly Away Once in a Great While, and it's escapist theology and totally contrary to our very theological structure, but it's a fun song to sing, darn it, and I like playing it on the guitar. But... Um, they said, well, how can we ask draw God to draw us close? How can God be any closer to us? We already exist in, in this relationship with God. We can't get closer to God. That's just that, that. Well, we understand what we feel when we feel separated from God. When we have those moments where it feels like our prayers only go as far as the ceiling, when it feels like we've lost that relationship. But we also, I hopefully at the head, even if the heart doesn't always get it, at the head we understand that that's us. That's us separating, that God isn't going anywhere and that our relationship didn't separate. And it's the same with faith. We may feel like, I just don't have enough faith to do that. No, no. We, what, what's the line? The young man said, you know, I, um, I believe, heal my unbelief. That's really something totally different. Uh, so many things in the world do cause us to question our belief in God. We struggle sometimes with, well, how, why would a loving God fill in the blank? Why did God allow that? Why did, I, I know I've been there. I know a woman in um, one of our congregations just absolutely, if, if anybody's, if we ever institute the principles of sainthood, she gets one. I'm going to vote for her. Unbelievably incredible woman, been in a wheelchair her entire life, very limited in her speech ability because of a stroke. And yet one of the one of just truly the most godly women that I've ever encountered. And um, 
I know one time she, if, if somebody puts a pen in her hand, she can very slowly move her hand. She wrote me a letter one time. Two pages letter thanking me for some brilliant thing I did. Two pages. It must have taken her the entire week. I wept. I've argued with God many an occasion about this woman. Come on, you heal. This is, this is the person. Do this. Heal this person. Now, I can also hear God saying, okay, well, think of how many people their faith is strengthened because of her and what she does in this situation. And I go, yeah, 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 God, that's fine for you. Now, I want, I want you to heal her. But there's so many other things questioning us. We begin to question from time to time, God, what science is attacking us with this. You know, academia is arguing this. It's not uncommon for us to struggle with belief, but then there's nothing wrong with crying out to God to help us overcome doubts, to help us overcome unanswered questions. I have a lot of unanswered questions. I'm looking, now I always tell people, well, boy, as soon as I, as soon as I'm in the presence of Jesus, I'm going to ask him about this. I'm going to, I want to know who subcontracted knees because they are poorly designed. I want to know why the pit is so big in an avocado. I've got questions I want to ask. And I also know that when I'm in the presence with Jesus, I'm not going to care a whole heck of a lot about avocado pits, but it's still fun to speculate. But the, the, nothing wrong with praying for answers to questions, but we need to remember that our faith, however, as mustard seedy as it might be, it's our faith that draws us to actually question and struggle with unbelief. And that faith, again, is a gift from God. It's the faith of Jesus Christ that we are called to participate in that allows us to move forward in our Christian walk. It's not something we drum up. It's not something that, well, if the worship music was just, if they had somebody playing drums today, my faith would be stronger when I left. Depending on who the drummer is, I might lose my faith. I'm picky with drummers. Faithfulness, on the other hand, faithfulness is our response to our faith. It's what we do with our faith, and that is up to us. Faithfulness is defined as being loyal and obedient to the person we put our trust in, and we put our faith in Jesus. So we also have to be faithful to Jesus. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, we put our faith in him. When we accept Jesus as our Lord, we put our faithfulness in him. Jesus needs to be both our Savior and our Lord. It's not enough to say, well, you know, thanks, Jesus, for dying for me. See you later. When we accept salvation, we die that day. We are no longer who we were before, Paul tells us. At baptism, we are resurrected as a new person, and we no longer live for ourselves. We live for Jesus Christ. And as believers, we must give our entire life, every part of it, every aspect of it over to God. We have to say, God, here I am. Use me as you wish. And when we do that, we have to be willing to be faithful in what we're called into. When God says, okay, here's what I want you to do, we have to be faithful to do it. It's not a matter of faith. It's a matter of faithfulness. Now, as humans... We like to use excuses. I am the master of excuses. I think one of the one of the the edges I have of being a regional director who also pastored for a lot of years is that when pastors in my region tell me why I couldn't do this or why I couldn't do my report or this happened, I've used every one of those excuses at least once. So we like to use excuses. I'm not ready yet. I'm not prepared enough. I, I need to learn more. I'm too young. I'm not that we'll ever hear this one. I'm too old. I just need God to give me more faith. If you are a Christian, you are ready to do whatever it is God wants you to do, regardless of age, circumstances, limitations, etc. Because he's God. He knows you. If you weren't ready, he wouldn't have called you. If you're a Christian, remember, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the gift of faith. 
All you need to do is be faithful with what you've been given. Show your faith by stepping out and relying on his strength, not your own. That is faithfulness. Now, Jesus leaves us a very short parable to uh, help put things into perspective. Um, We heard it read. Um, I'll go through and read it again very quickly. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. I used to struggle with that, with giving, actually. Um, I grew up in a church where where tithing was a command. It was a mandatory 10%. But here's the problem. If you only give 10%, you're doing exactly what you were commanded to do. But Scripture tells us we're to go above and beyond. and Otherwise, we're an unprofitable servant. So if I give more than 10%, I'm still doing what Scripture said, so I'm still an unworthy servant, and it used to be this circular thing that would drive me slightly nuts. But see, here's the deal. When we follow, faithfully follow God, we don't get a medal. There's not a participation trophy. Also played. When we do good works for God, it doesn't help pay for our salvation and doesn't buy us anything. Now, faithfulness is merely part of our job description. It's expected. A servant is expected to serve. How does Paul describe himself in the beginning of half of his letters? I, a servant of Christ. Paul did what a servant was called to do. And he did it to his best. A Christian is a servant, and therefore, a Christian is expected to serve, to be faithful. See, when we get the feeling that something is not quite right in our walk with God, it's not that we lack faith, it's that we lack faithfulness. If our spiritual tank is running low, we can't come to church and say, hey, fill me up. We can't blame the worship leader and the worship team if, if, wow, it just wasn't, I just need to be I hear this, I made this statement and got in trouble for it, so I'll make it here and get in trouble again. Um, I I was in a meeting in a congregation, and and somebody was complaining loudly, and never never do town hall meetings for the congregation before the church service, particularly if I'm preaching. I'm meeting with some of you, it's afterwards, so you won't hear what you said repeated in the sermon. But in this particular case, I'm in a meeting before, and somebody's going, we just, our problem is, is that we're not getting spiritually fed. And I'm like, really? And somebody else said, we, we want to leave here spiritually full. I said, okay. If you're being, and that's nothing wrong with being spiritually fed, is there? I love the idea, but here's the problem. If you're not being spiritually, if you're being spiritually fed every week, and you're not emptying yourself during the week, to come back and be spiritually fed again? All you are is a bunch of obesely, spiritually obese Christians. That didn't go over well, by the way. I did have conversation afterward about that. You called us fat. I said, look, am I going to call anyone fat? No, no, no. We're not talking about that kind of obese. We don't go there. But the idea that, well, I'm going to come and I need my tank filled up. Okay, good. If that happens for you, praise God. What are you doing with it this week? Where are you using that? Where are you expending that during the week? See, the Holy Spirit dwells within us, and therefore God can work best within us if we let him and if we follow him. And that's the kind of perspective that I know I yearn for in my own life. That's also the kind of perspective that I yearn for in I yearn for that in this, and I yearn for that in every congregation I have the opportunity to work with and the opportunity to speak to and the opportunity to observe. And I love to see what some of the things that you guys have been doing. I brag about this congregation on a regular basis. 
because of some of the things you've been able to do, your back to school events, some of the other things that you have began to connect working with school, etc. I'm like, hey, you know, you guys, let me tell you about a church in Southern California that um, is really making, beginning to make a difference. You guys are stepping out on that because you're allowing God to work through you. See, I would desire if I were pastoring here that this be a place where we are so busy being faithful to God that he wouldn't have any that we wouldn't have any doubt about the state of our own fuel tanks. We'd know that they were full because we'd be constantly using them. And it's only when we start using our faith that we realize that our faith's not going to run out. Jesus is sufficient. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on the fact that we all feel inadequate at times. All of us do. We have all wondered if our best is good enough. The greatest of parents feel completely overwhelmed at times. The most seasoned pastor will find times that they're standing up here going, why am I the one here? Why am I talking and why are these people actually listening to me? Caught me off guard one time when I very, very first began to preach and I noticed somebody sitting somewhere out there and they were frantically writing down everything I was saying in notes. And I almost stopped in the sermon because it just was so absurd to me that someone would be writing down what I was saying. Don't they realize that I'm just figuring this out myself? They realize that half the time I'm preaching to me, not them, in the first place? Half the time I feel like I, I had a history teacher once, and I complimented him on his incredible knowledge of history, and he says, I don't know that much about history. I'm only required to know more than you. Uh, just described every person who stands up here and preaches. The most brilliant scientist will come across a problem that they're going, ah, this is not solvable. Inadequacy does not feel good, but it, it's also a part of the Christian life because it's in our inadequacy that we can better appreciate the sufficiency of Christ. It is then that we realize that we are nothing without Jesus, that it is Jesus that is doing it. We get to participate. It's Jesus' faith that enables us, and we're not drumming it up on our own. We are called to participate. And how often do I watch church, I watch leadership teams go, well, we're going to do this new ministry, and now we're, we've made this decision, we're going to do this ministry, and now we're praying that God would bless it. And I'm like, why don't you actually look at what God's calling you to do and what God's blessing and then pray that you can participate in it and be a part of it? Seems a little backward to me sometimes. But when we are dealing with our doubts and our inefficiencies, we are reminded of the importance of humility. And it is then that we can be trusted to be the conduit of the miraculous. I know I've gone through periods in ministry where I just, I struggled and debated. Is this really, have I reached my sell-by date? Is it time for somebody else to be doing this and and in some cases the answer is yeah we're getting close somebody introduced a song they wanted to do with a worship team and i play guitar in our worship team and i'm a i'm an avid mercy me fan i don't know how many of you are mercy me fans but to me i love mercy me one because i like their music but i love mercy me because they sing our theology and um and bart bart ballard is ballard is very much Everything he writes and everything he says would come from this pulpit with no problem whatsoever. And so I really enjoy their music, but I had not heard this song. It was brand new. And a worship leader's going, you got to learn this song. We're going to do it. And it's got a cool little da-da-da-da-da guitar line thingy on the front end. Okay, I listened to the song, and it's called Even If. And if you're familiar with it, cool. If not, I'd suggest tracking it down. I listened to the song and it basically somebody had been reading my mail 
it was the very issues I was struggling with in my own personal ministry at that time, even down to lines that I could change two words and it could be my testimony. And here's some of the lyrics from this song, by the way. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose. And right now, right now, I'm losing bad. I've stood on this stage night after night, reminding the broken it'll be all right. But right now, right now, I just can't. It's easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down. But what will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am right now? They say it only takes a little faith to move a mountain. Well, good thing, a little faith is all I have right now. But God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, give me the strength to be able to sing, it is well with my soul. The chorus is, I know you are able and I know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. I know the sorrow and I know the hurt would all go away if, I, if you just say the word. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. Anybody who stood up here, Anybody who has served in a pastoral role has had moments where that particular song would speak to them, where that particular song would, you're, I've stood on this stage time after time. In Christ's response to his disciples' expressions of inadequacy, he didn't try to make his followers feel better. He didn't quote an affirmation or pray a prayer of empowerment like they wanted. Just the opposite. He confirmed their inadequacy. In themselves, they were incapable of meeting the standards set by Christ. And at the same time, he revealed his overwhelming sufficiency and his willingness to work for our good. See, this is the good news for all of us who call on the name of the Lord. It's what gives us the strength to step out in faithfulness, to exercise the gift of our faith. And to sing, it is well with my soul. Even during the times, our faith meter feels like it's on empty. When faced with a daunting challenge, let us not make the mistake of the apostles and ask for more faith. Rather, let us turn to Christ and live in the reality of his sufficiency. Amen.